Thank you very much. Very kind introduction. I'm Kevin Cavanaugh, board chairman of HealthWatch USA, and it was stated this was a Kentucky-based, although it's now become more of a national scope, patient advocacy and health policy research organization. Today, I'm going to talk to you about multidrug resistant organisms. And for the purpose of this lecture, we'll define this as bacteria which are resistant to three or more classes of antibiotics. And I've listed several classes of antibiotics on this slide. In addition, we're going to be talking about the incidence of cost of multidrug resistant organism infections, antibiotic overutilization, agricultural usage of antibiotics. We will focus on three different types of multi-resistant drug organisms, those being methicillin-resistant, Staph aureus, Clostridium difficile, and Carbapenem-resistant, Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE. Most people call it CRE because the name is so complex. And finally, we'll conclude by the importance of facility and health department coordination. Now, each year in the United States, at least 23,000 people die as a result of these infections. This is probably a very low estimate because as you'll see during our lecture, the reporting system in the United States is fragmented, not comprehensive, and is in great need of improvement. Now, these infections are gonna transform healthcare and not in a good way. Once treatable diseases uh, may become death sentences. And this includes patients needing organ transplants, chemotherapy for cancer, immunosuppression for autoimmune diseases, uh, treatment of asthma, immunocompromised patients such as diabetes, and even elective surgeries are gonna carry a higher risk. And certainly people are gonna think twice about having an elective surgery if there's an outbreak of one of these infections. Now, what's the cost of these infections? Well, it's hard to determine because data is fragmented. And for much of this lecture, we're going to be combining data of healthcare-associated infections with that of multi-resistant drug organisms. And most of our healthcare-associated infection data comes from hospitals. Although many hospital-acquired infections are drug-resistant, not all are, and of course, there are many more infections uh, which occur out in the community, nursing homes, other types of facilities, et cetera, of drug-resistant organisms than what are just seen in hospitals. But nevertheless, the data is fragmented, and this will give you some idea of the scope of the problem. So if we look at hospital-acquired infections or healthcare-associated infections, a March 2009 study by Scott put the range of cost between 35 to $45 billion. This is a huge amount of money, but it pales in what's going to be coming. This is a draft that is taken by a study from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, that is a English United Kingdom nonprofit organization, similar to Robert Wood Johnson's over here, and uh, published by the HM government, that's the United Kingdom, Her Majesty's government. And this shows that by the year 2050, these infections worldwide are projected to have a cost of over $100 trillion. And of course, you know, when it gets that high, what's a trillion? Remember, a trillion is a thousand billion. So if you think the billion was large, this is going to be even greater. The OECD countries, now OECD is Organization for Economic Cooperative Development. It's a treaty organization of 35 industrialized nations of which the United States is one of them. They're projected to have a cost between 20 and $35 trillion. Now let's look at the cost in lives. If you look at the cost in, in lives, currently it is estimated that 50,000 lives are lost every year in the United States and Europe. And this is, a, again, a huge number, but may well be a low estimate. If we look at lives lost in nursing homes, many of these are from healthcare-associated infections, and many of these infections are antibiotic-resistant, becoming more and more frequent. 388,000 deaths and 2 billion a year. 
and this was published in May of 2011. So again, we're talking about very large numbers. Worldwide, the Wellcome Trust Study estimates that by 2050, we are looking at 10 million lives lost worldwide, and this will then outpace cancer as far as being a cause of death that is extremely common and indeed going to be something that will not only transform healthcare but may also transform society as a whole. This is a map showing what is predicted for 2050 and as you can see in North America we're looking at 317,000 deaths a year from these types of infections. Now we're going to talk about two of the drivers of infections and these are something that we really need to focus on because both of these are important. The first is antibiotic overutilization. Now obviously you would not have antibiotic resistance to the degree it is today unless you had antibiotic usage. So this is key. Uh, the United States is shown here. The countries which are darker have higher incidence of antibiotic usage and we're about in the middle. Uh, this data is from the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy. They survey outpatient labs for resistant infections and pathogens. They also provide and compile data on utilization of antibiotics. If we look at the national map of the United States, this is 2016 Medicare data of prescriptions written. You can see that Kentucky is at the bullseye of antibiotic usage. So we not only overutilize opioids, but we also overutilize antibiotics to a huge degree. And this is not good. This is a graph of showing different types of antibiotics. And what I want you to focus on is the line that is second from the bottom over on the right hand side. This is kind of purplish and these are the quinolones. These antibiotics are on the rise as far as usage in the Kentucky. Uh, this is not good. Approximately one in five Kentuckians get a prescription every year, which is a lot. And uh, these are dangerous antibiotics, but very powerful antibiotics, and they should not be frequently used. And we'll talk a little bit more about the quinolones later on. So our antibiotic usage is not going down. We're almost prescribing on average of 1.5 prescriptions for every man, woman, and child in Kentucky. Now there's also in the United States, we have non-prescription antibiotics. And I should add that that's the case worldwide also. There are many countries that you do not require a prescription to get an antibiotic. So curtailing antibiotic overutilization is going to be tough to do. This is an example of a triple antibiotic ointment, which can be bought over the counter. It's often said these antibiotics are low dosage in this ointment, but you need to remember that exposure to low dosage is what really stimulates resistance. So that will not save this product from being in a category of products that I feel may be a driver of antibiotic resistance. Polymyxin B is contained in this product, and that is very worrisome. Polymyxin D is colistin, they're quite similar. And polymyxin D, as we will discuss later on, is the last line of defense antibiotic, the only antibiotic that is effective against CRE. And it unfortunately is an antibiotic which you're seeing resistance develop to from CRE. So this product I feel is very worrisome and I would feel much more comfortable if you saw reformulation of the product. Now let's talk about antibiotic usage in agriculture. This is another problem. 70% of antibiotics used in the United States are used in agriculture and the vast majority are not used to treat disease. 95% uh, are put in the food and water. We use prophylactic to prevent disease. They may be used as additives trying to stimulate growth. But nevertheless, they should not be used in agriculture. And I think that you'll be seeing either legislation or regulation or voluntary compliance of antibiotics being curtailed for this usage. In some countries, it is illegal. 
approximately 96% of these antibiotics are sold over the counter. Now, why is this important? Well, there's good evidence that you can get spread of antibiotic resistance from the farm to the environment. There's also good evidence it can spread to humans via processed food, such as salmonella if, if you order chicken, and some fast food restaurants that serve chicken that have been involved in infectious disease outbreaks. So this is a problem. And there's also mounting evidence that there may be direct spread of the organisms which are in animals to humans. Uh, however, uh, the percentage of human infections that this causes and also the importance or how great of a problem this is creating to the human population is really something that is still under investigation. But with the evidence that we now have, the overlying question is, is it worth taking a risk to continue feeding animals antibiotics? And the answer to that is no. Now, we're going to talk about common resistant organisms. And there's three of them, which you hear a lot in the news media, so I thought I would focus on these. They're methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, Clostridium difficile, and Carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. All three of these, the prevention is somewhat different, and we'll discuss that also. Mechanisms of resistance also can vary. If you look at how the United States is doing with combating these infections, the answer is not very well. Uh, this is data from uh, the CDC that's acquired from hospital-associated infections. Clampsies in the upper left-hand corner, which are central line infections, have had a marked reduction. That's 50 percent. These infections are really prevented by proper protocols. If you clean, sterilize the area, insert the catheter, cover with a barrier, uh, you will have a much lower incidence of infections. And by implementing proper protocols, you've seen a marked reduction in these infections. Uh, Catheter-associated infections have not budged much. There's a number of reasons for that, and maybe that the method of measurement isn't quite as good as it should be, and we have published articles on that. MRSA bacteremia, which is bloodstream infection, has only fallen 13%. They've missed targets on that. It was supposed to be 25% by 2013. C. difficile infections down 8%, uh, so that's barely uh, budging also. Now, mechanism of resistance can be enzymatic production by the bacteria that breaks down the antibiotic. Uh, there's a process called multidrug efflux pumps, which can be stimulating bacteria to pump out the antibiotics. And of course, you can have barriers of the antibiotics uh, penetrating the walls. The important thing to realize is that resistance stimulated by one class of antibiotics can cause resistance to other classes of antibiotics. A multidrug efflux pumps oftentimes pump out everything, numerous classes of antibiotics, not just the one. And similarly, transmission of DNA to confer resistance or coding to produce a enzyme to break down the antibiotic, sometimes those plasmids will have multiple DNA segments coding for multiple antibiotic breakdowns, and so that when you start transferring this resistance, you're transferring it to multiple different types of antibiotics. Now let's talk a little bit about methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. This is a very common infection, all too common, unfortunately. It's primarily soft tissue and skin, at least in the beginning, but it can spread and become fatal. Earlier last year, our group published CDC data from NHSN, which was showing an increase in infections. This was 2015 data. Now you can see the bloodstream infections missed the 2013 goal of a 25% reduction, and we're nowhere on track of a 2020 reduction. Uh, we had shown this data to the CDC. Uh, they felt that it was due to a change in the way they measured the infections uh, the year prior was why we saw an increase. They changed the way that they measured community onset infections. And that to us was a little bit disturbing because it means that hospital onset infections are adjusted for high rates of infection in the community. So you have a lot of MRC in the community, then the MRSA infections that's recorded by the CDC is down adjusted. And I don't feel that that type of risk adjustment is appropriate. 
but we were all in agreement that rates are not going down as well as they should be. Now in Kentucky, we're doing terribly. 25% increase on the last data which is available. We are in the lower echelon ranking of the states and District of Columbia. We are 45th. If you look at individual hospitals, we have one hospital, Baptist Health in Louisville, which is doing better than expected. Four hospitals doing worse, University of Kentucky, Norton's Hospital, University of Louisville, and Lake Cumberland Regional Hospital. Now, this epidemic can be reversed. This was shown early on in Denmark with epidemiological intervention tracking. Uh, they were able to reverse and drop the rates. So it's not like this is something we have to live with. Now, there are two methods which are currently advocated for facilities to try to reverse this epidemic. One is surveillance and screening. The other is unit-wide, facility-wide daily bathing with chlorhexidine. There is a huge push to implement these protocols uh, simply because we are missing our targets. That was also reported by uh, Reuters News Service. Now let's talk about surveillance and screening. Uh, this is done by a lot of institutions, but I will focus on two of them. The United Kingdom, which is a whole country, and we'll also talk about the U.S. Veterans Administration. Now the U.S. Veterans Administration has seen a huge drop in MRSA, 87% in the ICUs and 80% in non-ICU areas. They implement universal screening along with isolation. They also emphasize hand hygiene. This is an example if you were to graph these two data sets of what non-VA hospitals report to NHSN are doing with bloodstream infections versus the VA, what they are doing with total infections. And as you can see, you have a marked improvement in the VA, not much improvement, maybe a worsening in the private hospital systems. And so this is quite disturbing. The other factor is one data set's measuring bloodstream infections, other data set's measuring all infections. We have no idea how to compare the starting points. And again, this goes back to not having an effective tracking system in the United States. And this is for MRSA. So many questions could be solved if we had a universal effective tracking system. Now let's talk about England. United Kingdom is the purple line. You can see a marked decrease, approximately 70% decrease, which is huge. And this happened with the implementation of both hand hygiene and surveillance and isolation. So which caused it? Well, hand hygiene is very important. However, it is my opinion that these bugs should not be on the hands in the first place. It is actually a backup measure. And if you look at the other organisms that were tracked, if you look at methicillin-susceptible staph aureus, they did not see the 70% decrease. If it was due to just to hand hygiene, you'd expect both to decrease. But it was the surveillance which was added on which caused the decrease to go down. Now, of course, if you don't have good hand hygiene, you know, surveillance and isolation, uh, hand hygiene is part of isolation and contact precautions. You're not going to have a decrease. You need to have multiple things to intervene in order to achieve control. In other words, it's a bundled approach. So who does the United Kingdom screen? Well, they don't do universal screening, but they do just about. Uh, they screen all elective surgical patients, all emergency admissions, critical care, ICU, step-down unit admissions, preoperative patients in certain surgical specialties, emergency orthopedic and trauma patients, oncology, chemotherapy patients, and patients admitted from high-risk settings. And so when you tally up all of these patients, the logical result, and this is in uh, UK's protocols for the National Health uh, Service, the logical result is just to screen everybody. It's just easier to do. Now, when you look at the chlorohexidine bathing, uh, this is something our group has been very active in with research. It was popularized by a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine called the Reduced MRSA Study. But we have had significant questions regarding spinning of data, changing of metrics, and use of surrogate endpoints. Surrogate endpoints is simply you're measuring cultures instead of infections. Cultures is a surrogate for infections, but what you really want to see is a decrease in infections. Surrogate endpoints are not as good to measure, and so that was one of the primary outcomes was a surrogate endpoint. Now let's talk about spinning in this study. For example, in the abstract, they stated decolonization was more effective than targeted decolonization or screening and isolation and reducing rates of MRSA, clinical isolates, and bloodstream infections from any pathogen. That sounds great. 
In fact, that was similar to testimony given before the Presidential Committee on Antibiotic-Resistant Organisms. It reduces any pathogen. Well, the problem here is that any pathogen is actually referring to a composite category of organisms that had a whole bunch, and as a group, they reduced. And when you look at which bacteria were responsible for that reduction, it was primarily yeast and commensal bacteria. Commensal bacteria are the more benign bacteria, such as Staph epi. Now, that's not saying that's not important. If you're immunosuppressed in the hospital, that's a good thing. You can die from those bacteria. But it's not necessarily the answer for MRSA. In addition, the any pathogen, that metric or that measure was added after the trial completion date, which, again, is somewhat disturbing. We had published at least four articles on this uh, in peer-reviewed literature. And was one of the major factors, I feel, in stimulating the Reuters investigation, of which HealthWatch USA was quoted in this, uh, which looked at how conflicts of interest muddies research for addressing this epidemic. They found a million dollar donation uh, to one of the author's research. Uh, they also found uh, millions of dollars in wipes, which were provided free of charge by the company donated uh, to author's research. And so that there was a real question of, again, conflicts of interest in reporting results. Later that year, which would be last October, there was a report in Infectious Disease Week that the lead author uh, presented data that, well, this reduction was only in patients with central lines and other medical devices. Uh, this is after we, I heard testimony at the Presidential Council that 60%, possibly more hospitals, were using chlorhexidine to prevent infections. So only patients with central lines and other medical devices. So that's, that kind of reduces what you're looking at. And chlorhexidine is a long-acting antiseptic, so it makes sense to put it around a central line that you're then going to put a barrier over. It was then reported by the LA Times that chlorhexidine didn't even stop an MRSA epidemic in the lead author's hospital that was in neonates. And this is disturbing by two reasons. One, it didn't stop the epidemic, but two, they were using this on neonates. This is a fairly powerful antibiotic type of an antiseptic. It could conceivably easily be absorbed through the thin skin of neonates, and it can be toxic. It is not FDA approved for this use. In addition, there's concern that this type of product can stimulate resistance to other antibiotics or to other resistant drug organisms, such as uh, CRE, uh, through, for example, the stimulation of multidrug efflux pumps. So again, it kind of goes against the whole idea of antibiotic stewardship using an antibiotic universally. So that is one of the reasons why I feel that we're having trouble addressing the MRSA epidemic has to do with not adopting widely isolation and surveillance and by overutilizing antibiotic-based types of antiseptics. In addition, if you have to implement, and you should be implementing, surveillance and isolation, this is very staff intense and resource intense on top of hospitals so that there, I feel that there may be resistance in being willing to put forward these resources, especially when you have a literature which has become clouded. Now, the next organism I'd like to talk about is Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. Uh, this can cause a life-threatening or severe GI infection. It forms spores. There's a 20 to 30 percent return of infections from patients who have been treated and 95% of infections are linked to medical care. So remember, I said there's a lot of overlap between healthcare-associated infections and antibiotic-resistant infections. And this, this is something I think is almost like the perfect pathogen. I think back to Jurassic Park where it says, nature will adapt, and this is it. And it really can be resistant to anything because it can say, oh, I can't beat this. I'm just going to hide in my spore form for a couple of months and then spring out later. So it is very tough to get rid of and to fight. 
They predict in 2011, 29,000 individuals have died. Again, think back to the 25,000 figure total of all of these organisms, that that's probably really a low figure on what we're facing. Cost estimates to be close to $1 billion annually. Rates went up rapidly to 2007 and have become steady but are not dropping. A mortality rate is declining, and this is because of new ways of treating it, for example, fecal transplantation. For any of you who do not know what that is, it's passing a tube down into your GI tract and then putting down someone else's feces into your stomach. And this isn't sterile feces, they want the live bacteria. So if you were to mention this as a possible therapy 15 years ago in medicine, they'd lock you up and think you were insane, but this is how serious this infection is and how our antibiotic treatments have become ineffective. We're looking at fighting bugs with other bugs. You'll also hear sometimes about phage therapy, which is again fighting bacteria with viruses designed to target those bacteria. Now in Kentucky, we've had an 8% decrease, which isn't great. We're not doing well here. It can be much lower with good antibiotic stewardship in hospitals. But when you compare us to the rest of the United States, we're doing actually well. We're in the upper echelon of hospitals. And a large number of our hospitals, almost half of which report to NHSN, are doing better than average. We have three hospitals which are doing worse than average. And as I said, antibiotic utilization is the key to prevention. And fluoroquinolones is a drug which we use quite frequently. It is known to cause these infections. It also is something that the FDA says can have serious side effects and should not be used for common infections. And this includes the drug Cipro. It shouldn't be used in acute sinusitis, acute bronchitis, or uncomplicated urinary tract infections. So usage of this antibiotic, as you can see in Kentucky, is, is going up. It has risks of causing tendon ruptures. It has risks of psychological problems, such as depression, hallucination. And there have been reports that these problems can become permanent in patients. So it is best to avoid. It is a very good antibiotic when used for its indication, but it needs to be remembered it is a very powerful antibiotic. Now let me digress a little bit when we talk about what are the drivers of these infections. If someone is astute, you may ask, well, how come Kentucky is the number one area for overutilizing antibiotics along with quinolone usage going up, but we're doing so well fighting C. difficile? And the answer to that is, I don't know. But it really does show that A, we need to have better and more data, and B, that the primary driver of this may be centered in the healthcare delivery system, not in outpatient usage or in agriculture, which are very important. Don't let me have you think otherwise. But the primary driver may be in how we are treating, surveillancing, and taking care of infections that arise and identifying carriers. So all of this is important. Now let's talk about carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE. Uh, this is the emerging organism, probably has emerged. It's, it causes severe GI infections, a 50% fatality rate. Colistin is the last line of defense. It's a very toxic antibiotic when given uh, parenterally. However, CRE is becoming resistant to this antibiotic. And one of the questions at one of these presidential council meetings was, well, how come we saw a totally resistant CRE bacteria in livestock in Pennsylvania? And it was very difficult to come up with this. This is a bacteria that's untreatable, totally resistant, because colistin or polymyxins are not used in agriculture. And I was one of the comments from the audience, and my comment is, well, it's in everybody's medicine cabinet. And that's, I feel, the problem here. Surprisingly, although this is the most scared and fearful bug around, there's no national reporting system. Some states mandate reporting, but there is no national reporting system, no public reporting. 
We know that it is possible or projected to be possible to reduce infections by 70% over five years if you have a coordinated healthcare system and coordinate this with the uh, health departments. The CDC recommends that each institution has to have available screening methodologies and that they need to identify carriers of CRE from individuals that are epidemiologically associated with an individual with an infection. In other words, they really need to search this down and start testing people to identify carriers because this is an organism which you do not want to become as prevalent as MRSA. So how prevalent is it? Well, this is just fragmented news reports that I'm going to be presenting. A few research articles, but again, we do not have a good tracking system. Back in 2002 to 2010, approximately 5% of hospitals, 17% of nursing homes reported at least one infection of CRE. Nationally, Tom Frieden, who was at that time director of the CDC, stated that 40 Six states had reported at least one infection and that there are now numerous facilities which are involved in treating these organisms. In Kentucky, the Courier Journal broke in 2013 an outbreak in, in Kindred Hospital which they reported having 40 cases, uh, which was huge. At this time, HealthWatch USA was pushing for mandatory reporting of CRE that has been a long-term initiative of our organization. Another study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2015, looking at 2012-2013 data, and you could project that 4,500 people were infected with CRE. That's a lot. Now, that's nationwide, but still, when you talk about controlling an epidemic of five to 10 individuals, that's hard, 45 individuals, you know, by that time, the barn gate's been left open and the livestock have vanished. You've got now a significant problem. This is a public health report from Kentucky from 2014. Again, 30 cases of CRE in Kentucky. So let's get a little bit more recent data. And this comes out of Washington, D.C. This is a report that came out of a group of, of hospitals in Washington, D.C., and including some fairly large ones, such as MedStar, that surveyed 2,216 patients, large number of patients, and they found a carrier rate of 5%. That is huge. It is very disturbing. There was one report of this in the Washington Business Journal, and then it died. There is a MMRW report which is a periodical from the CDC, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, looking at a 2015 outbreak in Kentucky where there were eight patients in two different wards with four different types of bacteria, and they all had a very rare form of resistance to CRE. And this really was important because it demonstrates the importance of conjugation. In other words, the sharing of material between bacteria. CRE just doesn't have to pass it down through, through its prodigy and its children. It can actually give it to another bacteria, uh, to another bacterial species, and transfer resistance. So this is an extremely important mechanism and a very dangerous organism. In 2016, there was another outbreak in Kentucky. This was August 2016. This was reported in January 2018 of CRE in a Kentucky hospital, having 23 isolates. And this included, again, three different types of bacteria. And we can see here that this probably also was caused by conjugation, but didn't necessarily have that rare resistance that would really firm up that conclusion. But this is quite disturbing. And it's disturbing not only that we're seeing these infections, but also that as a patient, I would like to know if a hospital has a CRE outbreak and not read about it a year and a half later in a CDC report. So these need to uh, be publicly reported. I think that that is extremely important. Now, a coordinated approach is one which is very important to preventing CRE. If one facility gets the infection, 
They need to be able to coordinate with other facilities, other types of facilities to prevent spread. And this has to be done through the health department. Now, Health Watch USA was the driving force behind this regulation. As I had mentioned before, this has been a long-term goal. This was enacted by the Bashir administration. And I really think that we have a model reporting system in the United States. All types of facilities report, just not hospitals. Uh, in fact, I believe the word hospital was taken out of the regulation because it's healthcare facilities, whether it's nursing homes, surgery centers, dialysis centers, all of these facilities can have outbreaks of these organisms. Outbreak was defined in the regulation of what an outbreak is. Before that, the outbreak was defined by a hospital. They could define, you have to have 10,000 MRC infections in one day to be an outbreak. You can define it, the baseline, any way you wanted to, and it made, again, reporting very haphazard. You could have an ongoing endemic level of MRSA and not have an outbreak and never report. And it would look like there wasn't a problem. There's also electronic data transmission and reporting of a variety of different organisms, including CRE, C. difficile, MRSA, and the more highly resistant form of MRSA, a vancomycin resistant. So this is very good. And the only thing that I would like to see happen is for, again, this data to be timely and this data to be publicly available. Cruise ships tell you if there's an outbreak of norovirus that causes diarrhea, but if you have a deadly, potentially fatal outbreak of CRE, you can't find out about it. And I think that's not appropriate. Now, Kaiser Healthcare News reiterated the fact that no single facility or type of facility can solve this problem. It takes a coordinated approach. Uh, independent approaches will not work to control these epidemics. You need to have a coordinated approach. I feel that surveillance and identification of carriers is important for dangerous infectious pathogens. I think that there is no if, ands, buts about that, and that is resource intense. But the institutions which we are seeing that are having the most success appear to be the ones that are system-wide instituting surveillance and isolation protocols. And certainly that is what's called for now with the CRE epidemic. And as a patient advocacy organization, we're always asking, well, why aren't we doing it for MRSA if we're doing it for CRE? Or if you do it for Ebola? And the emphasis on hand hygiene, remember, it is a backup measure. These organisms should not be on your hands in the first place. I mean, could you imagine if that was the primary way of preventing Ebola? Yeah, if you get Ebola on your hands, just wash it. I mean, you know, it shouldn't be there in the first place. Hand washing is extremely important. Do not get me wrong. But in the context of multi-resistant drug organisms, it needs to be looked at a last line of defense. And this is a graphic from the Center of Disease Control showing a coordinated health system approach. And we really need that with good reporting, transparency, and timely public reporting in order to adequately address this epidemic. Thank you very much.